Hey guys, Big Paul here today with you from Anabolic Bodybuilding. I would like to talk about sarcoplasmic versus myofibril hypertrophy. The debate that is old as time in bodybuilding. Which grows more, the myofibril portion of the muscle fiber or the stuff that surrounds it, the sarcoplasm? And how do we train to get the most growth and the most size for bodybuilding? Um, you know, this, this is one that I, I've seen a lot of the, bro, uh, the scientists go at it with the bro, the bro science dudes on, um, I have my takes on it. Um, I'm not saying I'm right, but, uh, there, there certainly seems to be something to sarcoplasmic hypertrophy and, and I'll tell you why I think so. Before I do so, if you just take a quick second to subscribe to my channel and hit that thumbs up button, I'd really appreciate it. All right, so let, let, let's dig in it. So what is the muscle sarcoplasm? The sarcoplasm is the cytoplasm of the muscle cell. It is comparable to the cytoplasm of other cells, but it contains an unusually large amount of glycogen. Um, it is a glucose polymer. It's basically just sugar and water. Uh, myoglobin, which is a protein that's found in your striate muscles, um, a red-colored protein necessary for binding oxygen molecules that diffuse into the muscle fibers and mitochondria. The muscle myofibril. Uh, the myofibril, also known as the fibril or sarcostyle, uh, is a basic rod-like organelle of the muscle cell. Muscles are composed of long tubular cells called myocytes, known as muscle fibers in skeletal muscle. And these cells, in turn, contain many chains of myofibril. Fibrils. Each myofibril has a diameter of 1 to 2 micrometers. The myofibril is the contractile part of the muscle tissue. It's the part, it's basically like a piston, if I recall correctly, from anatomy and physiology and what makes the muscle contract. Um, the sarcoplasm is really just where all the stuff that the muscle uses for fuel, for repair, whatever um, is contained. So it's all the stuff that surrounds that. So the sarcoplasm versus the myrofibril. Um, the muscle fiber, um, you'll see here on the left, um, you can see myofibrils. This is, this is a, a muscle, this is a muscle fiber and you can, this is just a basic example. So if you wanna see the, an example of a myrofibril growth, versus sarcoplasmic growth you can see here on the this this let's just say the picture on the left is the initial state of the muscle you know the muscle fibers there that are, are there the myofibrils that are red contained inside the muscle fiber and the white area is the sarcoplasm if we have an expansion of the sarcoplasm you can see here in this in the uh middle picture there's no actual increase in the myofibrils, but the sarcoplasm has increased in size. Um, myofibril hypertrophy, um, this is where you have increase in the actual contractile portion of the tissue. So you'll see here there are more myofibrils that have grown in the tissue. Uh, bro scientists versus the real scientists. So a lot of scientists believe that psychoplasmic hypertrophy is overstated. Um, that it really doesn't contribute that much to the actual size of the, of the muscle cell, that it's more myofibril than it is sarcoplasmic. Bros believe that in, in the pump and getting full and flat and that you can definitely fill a muscle up and, and by, uh, you know, doing high volume training, things like that, as we mentioned. Um, studies have shown that the average person can increase the muscle si fiber size between 5 and 8% through glycogen loading. Um, but my thought is, are bodybuilders really average? I mean, you know, so, I mean, even, even so you think about five to 8%, let's say that you're completely flat, depleted of glycogen going into a show. You got a 300 pound bodybuilder. Let's just say 150 pounds of that mass is actual muscle tissue. Um, and if let, let's, let's go with the 5% number. Um, of 150 pounds, so that's seven and a half pounds, eight pounds, eight pounds added to you of actual uh, sarcoplasmic uh, retention from from additional glycogen is pretty significant. 
Think about adding eight pounds of steaks to your body, filling filling the muscles up that much. That is pretty significant when you step on stage. And it, who knows, a, a, a world-class bodybuilder may even be able to accumulate even more than that in glycogen storage. I don't think they have fully studied or, or understand how, how a bodybuilder has adapted to glycogen storage. We've seen guys in the past that have, seem to have an incredible propensity for glycogen storage. I remember hearing that Dennis Wolf, when I believe it was uh, Mila Sarchev trained him, would, would load him up on 3,000 grams of carbs per day going into the Olympia, and that wasn't even enough. He said he would just soak them all up and just blow up. Clearly, he had a higher capacity for glycogen storage than your average person does. So I don't know if you can use the average person as an indicator of how much glycogen a bodybuilder can store. Um, high volume metabolic training, in theory, this would be more conducive to sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, as I mentioned. High intensity progressive overload, in theory, would be better for force production and myofibril growth, as I mentioned. Although scientists say now that that's probably not the case. Um, I give you the example of Kevin Lavrone if you want to see what sarcoplasmic hypertrophy looks like. This dude would not lift six months out of the year, and he was famous for just looking like an average guy in the off season. And he would run a cycle, start training for like four or five months going into the Olympia, and just blow right back up. And it was ridiculous. I can't be convinced that you put on that much myrofibril tissue in that amount of time. My, myrofibril tissue takes a long time to accumulate. Um, and and there's just no way that that dude would blow up and, and shrink back up with, with changes in myrofibril tissue that quickly. It had to have been sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, I would think. I know this is just really bro logic and bro science-y and, and, but just looking at it, just, just, I, I have a hard time rationalizing how it could be anything else. Uh, there was a study done on bodybuilders versus strength athletes on muscle fiber composition. They compared both, um, the bodybuilders had the largest muscle fibers their actual muscle fibers were larger than the strength athletes, 88% larger than the control group. Holy shit balls, that is significant. So they actually had 88% more stuff in their muscle fibers than the than the um, control group did. And 66% larger than the power athletes. I see it all the time at the gym. I see guys that are that are incredibly strong. And can throw up some crazy weights that are not that big. Now, granted, there are other a aspects to strength than just pure muscle size. There, there is uh, neuromuscular motivation. There's um, technique. Technique plays a big part in it. Um, you know, leverage. Uh, you know how your joints are put together. Um, you know there there are other factors besides just pure muscle mass. Um, the body fi fi or bodybuilder fiber force production was more than the control group and slightly less than the strength athletes. So they had less force production. Bodybuilders force production per cross-sectional area. So this is where you're at, uh, measuring per square inch. I know they're not, this is not a square inch of measurement per square micrometer or whatever um, here versus the other athletes it was 66 percent less than the power athletes so the power athletes were generating more force production per cross-sectional area 66 percent more than the bodybuilders um and then the uh control group was they were 41 percent less than the control group as well so this would also point towards sarcoplasmic hypertrophy um, you know, and there is a chicken and egg scenario here that I've seen some scientists point out, and maybe that it's not that sarcoplasmic growth is what makes bodybuilders huge. Maybe guys that end up being bodybuilders are more genetically predisposed to sarcoplasmic growth. I seem to be one of those guys. If I eat carbs, take insulin, 
trade with high volume, I absolutely blow up. When I trade heavy, um, I don't seem to grow as much. I just don't. It's it's pretty wild to me. And I was a progressive overload hit trainer for years. And then when I switched to high volume, I just blew up. It's pretty wild. Um, anyway, if you want to look, look at some additional reading to dig into this, uh, Stronger by Science, it's Dr. Brad Schoenfeld's. Uh, website. He has an article up about this very topic and he goes into depth why he thinks it might be BS um, and that it's been overstated. I would like to see if I can get Dr. Brad on here sometime. I've read some of his books and he's one of the smartest guys out there, if not the smartest guys out there when it comes to training. Um, he has some very revolutionary ideas and, and has science to back it up. The study that I quoted, uh, also the single muscle fiber contractile properties differ between bodybuilders, power athletes, and control subjects that, um, well, both of these will be linked, uh, video description below. I will have that, uh, there for you so you can go and check it out if you want to. All right, guys, hopefully you found this informational. Let me know what you think in the comments section. Um, if you know, if you disagree with me, let me know why. If you agree with me, let me know why. Give me your thoughts. Take care.